uh, among the communications I look at most mornings are the briefs that come in from the Brookings Institution. Uh, and I find them interesting even if I don't get beyond the title. Uh, but this particular morning, there was a article in the brief uh, where the title really grabbed my attention. Uh, it read, to counter extreme politics, revive global democracies, rust belts. Uh, and when I read the first sentence, uh, I got even more interested. Uh, it said, as the Biden administration attempts to reforge global alliances and reanimate U.S. leadership of the international community, one place to begin that work is right here in the American Rust Belt. Uh, and because we're in the Rust Belt and because I believe in democracy, uh, I immediately did two things. Uh, I sent out a copy of that article to everybody else on the IOP team. Uh, and I set out to learn more about the American co-author of the article, uh, John Austin. Uh, and learning about Mr. Austin was pretty easy to do uh, because he not only has a national and international reputation, uh, but he also has connections to this region. Uh, so let me tell you just a little bit about him. Uh, he is past president of the Michigan State Board of Education. He directs the Michigan Economic Center and lectures on the economy at the University of Michigan. Uh, he also is a non-resident senior fellow of the Brookings Institution, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and the Upjohn Institute. His work with the Michigan Economic Center spurred efforts to transform that state's economy by making it a leader in the emerging green and blue sustainable economy. In 2006, Brookings published his seminal report on the Vital Center, which focused on the economies of the Great Lakes and Midwest. And in 2020, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs released his updated report entitled, A Global Midwest, The Path to New Prosperity. In that same year, John organized the Transforming Industrial Heartland Regions Initiative, pulling together an impressive array of organizations uh, from each side of the Atlantic, uh, in fact, tomorrow he will be at Georgetown's BMW Center for German and European Studies, convening a conference that will explore transatlantic perspectives on place-based development policy. Uh, and though we may not have transatlantic perspectives to move into the mix, uh, we'll actually be talking about place-based development policy uh, in one of our specialized sessions in the morning. As I mentioned, uh, John has ties to this region, uh, among them a son who is a student at Carnegie Mellon, uh, but more directly relevant, he has worked with faculty members from Carnegie Mellon, uh, from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, he's worked with the Allegheny Conference, and as you could tell from his exchanges with our county executive, with government officials from the region as well. Uh, just last month, he was here leading a delegation from the European Commission on a 10-day tour that began in Pittsburgh and went on to include Erie, Cleveland, Dearborn, Detroit, Ann Arbor, Chicago, and Milwaukee, which almost certainly means that his European guests have seen things in this country that most of the rest of us 
have not. Uh, Samantha and I were fortunate enough to join him and his delegation for uh, what proved to be a very stimulating discussion uh, at the Rivers of Steel Kerry Furnace site. Uh, and it left us feeling uh, even more fortunate that John, Mr. Austin, uh, had agreed to be with us today. So please join me in giving him a warm Pittsburgh welcome. Thank so thank you, Mark, for that overly generous introduction. I think I need some more titles, don't you? How about uh, the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Institute of Politics? No, it is a treat, as Mark knows, um, and thank you, Samantha and Brianna, for getting me here, because coming back to Western Pennsylvania is, is special. Uh, Mark didn't mention, I was born in an um, April snowstorm in Altoona uh, a while ago, which I don't remember, but I understand it's not a surprise that that's what happens in Altoona. And my dad, at that time, he had three Presbyterian churches in Clearfield County. He's a Presbyterian clergyman, and we moved pretty soon down to West Virginia to the coal fields um, where he had a network with other ministers of, of war on poverty era Presbyterian churches trying to make a difference and provide service in that part of the world. And I think that uh, certainly educated me because I went to school in Charleston, which is in the Chemical Valley. You know, our economies, our lives are so similar in this industrial cockpit of Americans' creation of last century's economy, highly interconnected, as I'll show you. But also, the, it got me understanding the look, feel, and opportunity set of people in this part of the world. And also that we got a lot of work to do to help more people have a shot at a better life in this era uh, as they had a chance at a really good life in the industrial era that, that made us great. So I'm going to be telling you a lot about pathways to new prosperity in similarly situated industrial heartland uh, communities, small and large. Uh, I'm going to try not to talk about your communities because that's very dangerous because you know way more about them than I do. But I'm going to try to illustrate with a lot of examples from similar communities in this region that shares a economic development and cultural and social development sort of arc of, of commonality, uh, has a common storyline. Um, and then, but I'm going to start with giving you kind of the, the history of this region's development, which as Mark alluded, we first kind of mapped out in 2006 with this Brookings study. Uh, what is the story of this agro-industrial heartland that grew in a similar fashion and created similar strengths and similar weaknesses in today's economy? And how do we leverage those strengths and treat those weaknesses moving ahead? And how are communities of different sorts succeeding at doing that while others, as you know, still struggle? So this is a unique economic and social uh, region. Um, the Northwest Territories, before they were states, were organized politically way back in the 1700s when we first got this territory after the wars with France and Britain. Uh, they were modeled, their political organization was modeled on Pennsylvania and the New England states, uh, which included valuing education, it's right in the Northwest Ordinance, free labor, not slave, um, local governments close to the people. That's why we have all these small governmental units, municipalities, townships, more than any place in the country, which as you know, we'll come to that, creates both ch many challenges today, uh, and some of the symptoms of our challenges are, are linked to that. But it's a good idea at the time, for sure. And it still is a good idea if we can figure out how to do it better in a different era. Civil rights, religious freedom, that's what set the table, or set the organization framework for this region. And as you know, this region had tremendous natural resources. Rich, richest farmland on earth, uh, raw materials, ores, timbers. Uh, that bounty attracted settlers who poured in as we connected them to the Erie Canal, brought people and the ability to send goods out of the region. As you know, this pitch from Pittsburgh and Buffalo West, lean west, were connected to the Ohio River and to the Great Lakes, uh, all the way out to the, uh, where the, the economy changes, the topography changes in the plain states. Uh, but this is also the, these resources began to be converted to the great industries that powered the 20th century, um, inspired tinkerers, created the industries, the oil industry, the aviation industry, the auto industry, the durable goods industry, the food processing industry. 
You know, in, in Cincinnati, there was a break on the river where they brought hogs to market, chopped them up, and turned them into soap. Later, it's a consumer products giant, Procter & Gamble. This is the story of our region, the crucible of America's 20th century economy in all domains. And it powered this economy. It created good jobs and wealth. I mean, look at these names, these iconic names, many of them sprinkled around this town and our towns. Great wealth was created. I mean, you can't look at <laughs> Pittsburgh and the, even the campus of Carnegie Mellon and U Pitt and see, wait, there was a lot of money here. And as we took the Europeans through Cleveland, there's a lot of money here. Uh, and these are the innovations, the center of innovation, everything from the um, skyscraper, the assembly line, which changed the way we make things around the world, to more recently, the internet. The Big Ten Universities Plus created the backbones of the internet. The browser, the search engine, built the pipes. And so it's an amazing center of innovation going ahead. And you can see it built this agro-industrial economy of making things, built this dense network of small and large uh, manufacturing mill, machining towns, sprinkled amidst the cornfields and the forests of this upper Midwest and linked by the growing transportation links that you can see. You know, I grew up on next to a, a railroad line in Coal River Valley where the, the coal trucks or the coal um, trains would rumble by every, every couple hours. And here we are right here. The same thing is going on. This is this, our story. And immigrants came from abroad. Um, this Henry Ford's second great innovation after he per perfected the assembly line uh, was the vertically integrated Rouge production facility where one day raw materials, the ores and the other raw materials you need to make cars came in one door off the Detroit River. Two days later, a car truck was moving out the other door. When he opened that in 1917, 100,000 people from 47 countries showed up for work. And you had similar scale in the enterprises, the steel and other enterprises around here. Tens of thousands of people, immigrants from all over the world. You also saw the great migration for opportunity of blacks and whites from the South and Appalachia uh, that came to our northern industrial cities for a better life and a chance to get a good job and raise a family. You know, I never heard so many West Virginia accents until I lived and worked in the Flint area for 10 years. There's all these people from Kentucky and West Virginia who came and define the culture of those communities, just as the ethnic immigrants and, and, and African-American folks from the South defined it. We also, I didn't know this until I started doing this work, this region like built the employment contract that governs America's employment security system, if you could call it that. It was after World War II, where labor was scarce, the big employers in steel and autos wanted to keep workers happy, attract and keep them, the unions, UAW and others wanted health care, social, you know, socialized health care like other countries had. The big employers said, no, 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 no. We don't want socialized anything. We're going to give you the health. We'll pay for your health care. We'll pay for a defined benefit, benefit pension system, which was later copied by the public sector, first in Wisconsin, where the public sector gave a defined benefit pension to their employees. As you know, that agreement, that part of the agreement has been unraveled, and we struggled for years to provide a, a, a health insurance a system that replaces the one relying on employers, where you're not hostage the employer, but we built that system. It was, we cut the pattern, uh, which is another kind of interesting phenomenon about how we defined the social economic landscape and public policy landscape of America in the 20th century. But as you know, this is us. This is the Diego Rivera mural. He was fascinated with these giant large scale enterprises of production at the Detroit Institute of Art Museum. Um, it brought a great life. It brought good paying jobs for several generations. So this part of the world to the Midwest, this part of the world earlier, I mean, this was the busiest production region, industrial region on earth, right? For a good part of the time earlier than Michigan and other places developed. But then things changed. We had new competition from outside, globalization, industries restructured dramatically, employing, employing fewer people while they still had high value or disappeared entirely, some of our industries, wiping out these good paying assembly line, blue collar jobs that didn't require higher education or the skills that we talked about in the last go round. You used to be able to walk out of high school and many of our communities walk down to the mill or the plant or the machine shop and get a good paying job with benefits. That's gone, but that was the pattern that many communities got used to. So the region is in this transition from this 
to what is emerging in a spotty pattern across the region from an industrial powerhouse to a tech belt that is emerging and a thriving new economy that's uh, growing and is real in many communities in many parts of our region with new economic opportunity, new good paying jobs, but other communities still struggle. So this, as I said, this economic region does share this kind of profile of its economic pattern of development from Minneapolis and, and St. Louis in the West to the West leaning uh, industrial centers of Buffalo, Rochester, and, and where we are. And this legacy of this economy that we built still leaves us with tremendous assets that matter today in today's economy, which values knowledge and innovation ever more so, talent, highly educated people applying their skills in a tech-driven world. We still have lots of big companies, uh, that big global footprints, big GDP in this region. If we were our own country, we'd be ranked third or fourth in the, in the world as an economic region. This is probably our greatest asset. It's the unrivaled kind of innovation horsepower that we have in our companies and our universities in particular. We have 20 of the top ranked universities in the world in this region, this Midwest Great Lakes region, including Pitt and Carnegie Mellon, I think are on that list. That's more than West Coast, which has 13, East Coast, 15, Europe. This is, and these ours are bigger. They put, they put out tens of thousands of graduates. We disproportionately produce the innovations that power our country, intellectual property, new technologies, we win, particularly in our universities and working with our companies, uh, federal research dollars at scale. We produce a disproportionate share of the nation's engineers, MBAs, teachers, scientists, medical professionals. We have, as I said, outsized talent generation in STEM and, and medical complexes of learning and research that are concentrated in this region. And you know, this community is a great example of that, that, that have tremendous, in an innovation knowledge economy, this is where the new businesses, the new technologies, the new jobs of the future, which are these fast growing sectors, where there's global markets in the trillions of dollars for smart water solutions, clean energy solutions, everything's laced with data and IT systems built into, whether it's transportation or obviously communication. Um, food systems, health and bioscience, these are, these are the growing sectors, precision, high value manufacturing. Uh, we have the horsepower and are leading the way in many of these arenas. We also have these spectacular natural assets. Uh, lots of woods, lots of water, more fresh water resource uh, on earth. You can't move anywhere in the region without enjoying good parks now and, and these natural assets. And in a world of climate change, Places that are relatively um, climate friendly. We don't have fires and earthquakes. Uh, we have actually water, when water is getting scarce, it's now a, a risk driver for manufacturing or anybody else who needs to use water. They can't locate in lots of places. So we're a sustainable platform in the long run for more population growth and more um, business growth. One of the few places on earth, uh, a very attractive place in the global scheme. We also have these unique concentrated deficits that are legacies of the economy that we built together. The irony is while we disproportionately produce educated people and talent, we also have a disproportionate share of less educated folks, many already in the workplace. The thing on your left that you can't really see is the share of adults in our states that have just a high school degree that are out in the labor market already. And as you know, if you just have a high school degree, you aren't going to be able to get the good paying job that are out there right now. You can't be the robotics technician when you used to be, have an assembly line job where you did a manual labor. But, and that's a big challenge we have to fix. And, and we're disproportionately affected by automation, though as, as this community educated our study tour, because you've got the center of manufacturing automation innovation, at, at, uh, that building 18, that CMU and others, I don't know, is you pit a part of that as well? You get the center of, of robotic automation for the nation that's saying we're going to have need hundreds of thousands of robot technicians, which we don't have right now, that we're going to need to educate. So are, there are new good paying jobs, but they're different from the jobs of old. We also have this challenge, lots of innovation, lots of new technologies coming out of our hospitals, our research labs, our universities. 
that don't get found by the big money, the venture capital money. Look at California, almost $50 billion are spent to commercialize new technologies by California and in California, whereas in our region, and if you add it in Pennsylvania, it's not going to get that much bigger. Only 4.3 of the nation's venture capital is spent in the region. But, and I, ironically, <laughs> institutional wealth from our rich people, from our companies, from our universities, from our pension funds, which we invented the pension fund in the Midwest. We're half of the money that goes to fund VCs on the coast is coming from our pension funds. We need to get that money pouring back into making new jobs and businesses in these emerging sectors here. We also have, as you all know, some of the nation's oldest, most expensive to maintain infrastructure. Uh, you can see Pennsylvania is up. This is the cost if we rebuild our infrastructure in the Midwest by state. We have fiscally distressed and racially segregated. I think to your point, ma'am, Latino, the reason I would say the black-white focus is because it has been a uniquely big challenge and reality for us. We have the most segregated by black-white city regions in the country, 15 of the top 25. It's a defining feature, defining challenge for us. How do you bridge that opportunity divide? Now, obviously, our profile is changing with more diverse Latino populations, but we've been, we need to get more obsessed at closing those divides. But this, this government, look at Pennsylvania and Illinois have thousands of governmental units. Now, that works great if you've got a growing tax base, growing population base. As you know, many communities I know in your state and my state have lost their tax base, have lost their population, have seen that decline. It makes it very hard to solve that problem, that fiscal challenge. And it makes it hard, as you know, to do region-wide solutions for infrastructure or job training or economic development planning. It's a challenge to have these, these multiple units of government, some doing well, some doing not so well. And we've got more of this you know, than any place in the country. We've got 60% of the nation's brownfields. You know, there's probably a river or lake behind there that we need to clean up. So we've got unique deficits that are also a legacy. So today, though, different from 20 years ago when we did the first study, I don't use the term Rust Belt anymore because it really doesn't describe us. We're really two Midwest. For every Pittsburgh, shiny Pittsburgh all around us that obviously has evolved quite a bit, um, there's Sharon, Pennsylvania in the southeast corner, you know, up in the northeast corner, which is, looks more like this. For every Ann Arbor, where I live, which is Ann Arbor, Madison, all our university towns are just, you know, economically hovering off the earth to coastal, you know, standards. 30 miles away is Adrian in the northeast corner, a manufacturing town where they don't do much manufacturing of auto parts anymore, and everybody's addicted to opioids, and it's a struggling community. Um, so this is the reality. But there, and it's affecting our politics, which, uh, I appreciate your comments, Mark. Part of the reason we need to worry about this is because we've seen pretty clearly why we're doing this international work and trying to share ideas with partners in Europe and the UK and others. How do we accelerate economic change in these industrial regions that are so similar, in the Erie's of the world, in the Saginaw, Michigan's of the world? Um, because when we do, when communities find new economic purchase, when they turn an economic corner, the residents are optimistic and they're forward-looking. But where they don't, where once mighty industrial communities remain in decline, folks are understandably angry, frustrated at the condition of their community, feel like they're being ignored and, and upset, rightfully. But they are, that makes them also responsive to a kind of polarizing political messages, whether they're from the left or the right. Uh, meaning Bernie Sanders, excuse my French, tells people you're getting screwed, just as Donald Trump tells people you're getting screwed. Uh, it encourages a politics of resentment to blame somebody else for what's going on, to pull us apart. But if you change the economic condition in community, people are less eager to blame. They don't blame anybody else. They're optimistic about the future and the future of their community for their kids. It's the same story across the world, frankly. In the north of England, like the Guardian picture, 
Those are the communities that were the old mill and factory and industrial communities of the north. They're, most of them have been in decline for years, losing their big anchor employers. Those are the folks that were uh, behind Brexit. They're told, look, you've lost control of your life. It's the fact that we blame the Europeans, even though since Brexit, they're demonstrably worse off, the British economy. Um, it's the same in the north of France, uh, which is the kind of shattered industrial, their old industrial steel and, and manufacturing region that has lost a lot of its employment base. That's where the strongest support is for both the right-wing nationalists, Marine Le Pen, and the left-wing populists, who also say, you're getting screwed by change. Um, we need to do something dramatically different. Uh, it's the same in, in Germany where the Germans have done a better job at managing economic evolution of their industrial regions, but where they haven't, where they're still struggling the, in, in the old coal and steel or in the east, there's the strongest support for the right, right wing, you know, fascist nationalist party. In fact, you just heard two days ago, there was a coup attempt led by, in part, some of the right wing fascist um, electeds. Um, and it's true in the Donbass. The Donbass is the shattered industrial region uh, the, the, the heavy industry region that's seen a lot of decline in Ukraine, that's where there's a lot more support for a strongman solution, for Russia, for the nostalgia. The nostalgia is thick in these regions. I spend a lot of time in Flint where, you know, Flint, black people and white people are rightfully pissed off, but there's tremendous nostalgia for that bright, shining, you know, looks better in hindsight moment where it was a working class paradise. So, Preying on that nostalgia, promising to bring back the past, is what some of the polarizing leadership sells, whether they're left or right. But we can do better, and we are doing better. In this report that uh, Mark referenced, The Vital Midwest, a couple years ago, it tells a story, it tells many stories, about communities that are turning and have turned an economic corner of all sorts, including rural, in this region, uh, and how they did it, and the very different paths by which they did it, and the communities that I'm going to mention are there because they're demonstrably doing better now by like real metrics like population growth and our people our incomes going up not down those are probably the two best are you growing in population are you losing people are you your incomes going up or are you losing jobs and losing incomes uh, and as I said the Germans do this and I'm going to illustrate some of these paths in a moment the Germans have this Ruhr region, which is like, have you been, anybody been to the Ruhr? It is so much like Western Pennsylvania. You know, one steel and coal community and manufacturing community bumping up against another, looking over the hills, you see the next one. You know, they started 60 years ago um, trying to manage the change in this economy. They put, new, new, there were no universities in the Ruhr. It's now got more universities and more students than any place. They started that 60 years ago. They helped transition and retrain or relocate workers who are losing their jobs in coal and steel. They help communities build clean, green, new, sustainable communities. And they did things like this. This is their um, giant, it was probably predates Pittsburgh just by a couple of decades, their giant steel and coal facility. It's now a UNESCO site, it's an innovation center, it's a conference center, it's, it's a piece, a nod to their history, but a piece of a new economy that they're building uh, as they move ahead. And, and in Europe, they have a tradition of trying to spend money to help support the transition of communities in, in this move from the industrial community, the industrial uh, era to a new technology-driven era. And the, the red is where they spend more money. They spend more money in the places that need more support to make that transition, aren't doing it on their own. Uh, we don't have a tradition of doing that, though we're actually just beginning to meaning we've only had two big, we sort of say every place is on their own, people will move, whatever. We've had two big investment plays in the United States historically. One, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was the, you know, the New Deal of Roosevelt to try to invest in the South and Appalachia, a lot of through power generation, and that was you know, millions and billions of dollars. We also had during the worry about Appalachia where I grew up under, Kennedy and Johnson, the Appalachian Regional Commission was created and still exists to try to spend money. And actually, you're in the, in the service district, I believe, of the Appalachian Regional Commission, which extends up to Erie through the Appalachians. Let's spend more money as a nation. But actually, unwittingly or wittingly, 
the recently passed infrastructure bills, CHIPS Act, Inflation Reduction Act, it has more place-focused investments. On the left is like distressed community block grant opportunities for the communities that are in distress. The innovation hubs to fund new innovation, new emerging sectors focused on the heartland are in there, and that's billions of dollars. The things that are gonna help electric vehicles and clean energy production can be and should be focused on us because we got the horsepower to do that stuff here. Um, not every place in the world can invent, create, prototype, and make stuff at scale like we can. So we can benefit now, but we need to do more of this. So th there are a variety of paths by which similar older industrial communities are finding new success. I didn't just throw in Duluth for uh, Mark's benefit where he grew up, but you know, as an example, it's this historic, beautiful community with architecture cleaned up. It used to be the transit point for the iron ores coming out, uh, leveraging a regional university. Uh, now it's a real quality of life, place-based, um, attractive community that is doing better again. On the other side of Lake Superior is Marquette, one of my favorite places. Similarly, Marquette was, you know, the receipt of the iron ore and send it down. It had this industrial waterfront. They cleaned it all up. They repurposed it for access, parks, marinas, nod to the history, it sold off some for um, commercial development. Uh, Hazard Regional University is also wired early. Like 20 years ago, they wired Marquette and the whole UP so that now people are doing business people, tech people, because you a great lifestyle in Marquette. And then you can play in the world or do your business in the world. And it's growing, thriving, you know, old economy community. Uh, Dow Midland, which is the birthplace of, of the Dow company, Midland, they've diversified from Dow, as Dow was bought now by um, DuPont. And they, quality of life is their strategy, parks, libraries, great schools, lots of attractive downtown, near the Great Lakes, branding themselves as a Great Lakes community, a Great Lakes region. Uh, and so to be attractive to talent and people by providing them a great lifestyle. Some other communities succeed by leaning into universities. I mean, this Pittsburgh proper is a great example. Collapse of steel, but look what you got. You can't go around as we did with the Europeans to the, um, the, the Carnegie Mellon University of Pitt complex of innovation and new stuff and AI, robotics, medical, and, and um, computer science and not see the fruits of that evolution. Um, you know, this Building 18, which is housing the, um, a new national center for uh, robotics innovation, among other things, you know, in an old steel mill is a living example, but also, importantly, it's right down the hill from Hazelwood, right? Which is, you know, like so many, uh, a, a somewhat hollowed out uh, hillside community. A lot of people left, people there. Are, are those jobs being created in this, being available to those people who are left? Big work to do. We took the group up to Erie, and Erie's doing a lot of different things. But one thing that impressed the Europeans was you know, how communities like Erie and others are also leaning into their universities. Penn State Barron is the biggest regional Penn State affiliate, I believe, um, and Gannon University with their innovation center. Um, but they were, you know, students at Penn State Barron are in this um, creation lab with, with um, making new, um, what do you call that when you build things up with the swirling machine? The, uh, 3D printing, right? So they're, they're getting paid by the university to create new technologies, even build new 3D printers that they invent, uh, and then they're hired by the, by the companies and they keep the intellectual property, the patents, and the Europeans are like, we could never do this. They wouldn't let us do this in France, our universities, you know, because it's so entrepreneurial. You know, you have people working for companies and the universities providing the facilities and hooking them up, and so that's, you know, great opportunity for these kids and these companies to get problem solving done. Still others embrace, communities embrace a globalized world. Don't run from it, embrace it, and succeed in growing again. Um, Rockford, Illinois on the left is a manufacturing city, advanced manufacturing, lots of different firms. They aggressively build out their export sector, so they're exporting more to the world. Hamtramck, which is a a city in Detroit, it used to be called Pole Town because it was the old Polish community, hollowed out. Now, floods of immigrants from 50 countries. It's a vibrant downtown, a vibrant housing stock, uh, full of life. And just north of there in Troy, another community 
has the highest share of non-native born of, of immigrants in Michigan, 26%. It's a thriving community. Uh, and that's a path for many communities. Still others, as Mark alluded to, are growing their own new green and blue economies, smart water technologies, clean energy solutions. Uh, Milwaukee on the right realized, look, not only did they clean up their waterfronts in Milwaukee River, they built out their research capacity at their University of Wisconsin affiliate in water research, but they realized we've got 150, 200 firms that are in the water technology business of some sort, whether it's filtering or monitoring, uh, and let's grow that technology cluster of smart water solutions, which the world needs. And now they're a global water technology leader in Milwaukee. They used to be the machine tool capital of the world, beer, obviously, Harley Davidson's. Now they have a new profile in the world, solving the problems of the world. Adair County, Iowa is a rural county in Iowa. They, Iowa's embraced a higher portfolio standard for clean energy production and wind production. Adair County is thriving by both making and installing and having farmers get income from wind power in a rural America. Um, other manufacturing communities take their expertise into new domains. You know, this is in Cleveland. Case Western is a center of bioengineering technology. There's a lot more money to be made in making body parts than there are even in auto parts. Seriously, if, you know, $50 auto part is a $5,000 hip or body part. That's what they are doing there. That's, that's high value. And in Macomb County, Michigan, you know, we make cars and tanks and stuff. Now we're taking that high precision manufacturing to aerospace and other defense productions. This is, this is taking things into the future. In many communities here and in Europe, that's what they're doing. In other places, the company town employer, because a lot of our communities had a, they were company towns, right? And some, their company town employer has not been beat by competition, they've won. Cummings Engine in Columbus, Indiana, south of Indianapolis, where Goldschmidt was from, is a $50,000, $60,000, I mean, six person town. But Cummings Engine is their factory town employer, but they, they're, they're winning by making the greenest big engines, uh, the cleanest green engines. They have more clean energy patents for their, and so they're selling clean energy and clean um, diesel technology and, and clean net giant engines that go into all these big machinery throughout the world. Warsaw, Indiana is a home of a cluster of um, orthopedic make manufacturers. A lot of money in making these body parts, and that's what they do in Warsaw. Um, this is Rochester, Minnesota, which you know is is a town of what 70, 80,000, 90,000. Um, but since it's home to the Mayo Clinic, and the Mayo Clinic is one of those world leaders in health care delivery and innovation, Mayo, I mean Rochester is thriving in southeast Minnesota. You know. uh, and so that's obviously not something you can always affect. But other communities purposely build skills and become the best educated and mark themselves and attract employers and new residents. Uh, Georgetown, Kentucky is a smaller county uh, community north of Louisville. They had some learning institutions, uh, community colleges. They said, look, we're going to mark ourselves, as South Carolina has done to some extent, as a community that's organized to deliver the skills per, in part, what was talked about in the prayer session. We're going to tell employers, we will prepare and train and have the skilled workforce that you need. And it's worked. More employers are locating there because of that phenomenon. Kalamazoo is my favorite because Kalamazoo's done a lot of things right. They lost 40, 50,000 um, employers from Upjohn, which was their signature company, when Pfizer bought in 2003. Now they've brought back a little of manufacturing of the COVID, but they lost 50,000 people. But they didn't sit around. They said, look, we're going to keep some of that um, biotech talent, help them start new companies in biotech. We're going to clean up our downtown, which you now see. It used to be you couldn't see the river. It was buried um, that went through downtown and make it walkable and livable. They even subsidized Bell's Brewery uh, downtown. Anybody had an Oberon or a Two-Hearted? You know, they're pretty good. So that, the downtown's nice. But the main thing is, like, look, we're still hemorrhaging bodies from our community, our school system. They, in 2004, said, let's take private dollars, somebody endowed. Every community has wealth. Let's guarantee if you go to Kalamazoo schools and you graduate, you get a free higher education anywhere in Michigan. And that did three things. One, it motivated more people to get a higher education. 
Two, it reversed the exodus of middle class people from Kalamazoo. They started moving back in. That in and of itself will revitalize your community. But also send a message to employers, like this is a community that gets it. They're, they're serious about higher education attainment and the skills needed. Businesses go to Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo is going up in population and incomes when other communities that are just like it around the region are still dropping. Others leverage other special attributes of life and place and location in um, Madison County, um, Kentucky, or yeah, in Kentucky, you know, the bourbon trails, bourbon, uh, their identity, visitors, culture, activity. Same thing in Adair or Decorah, Iowa, which is on the north, is a rural Iowa town. But there's demand for local food and interesting food. They have pizza farms, whatever those are. So, you know, they're, they're becoming like a local center of, of local food and interesting food and getting both visitors and then people want to live there. Same thing in Brown County, Indiana, a small county in Indiana. They realized we got some arts and culture activity and some artists, it's like a little bit of an artist colony. They built that out. They have lots of arts related themed events, activities, new businesses. And so, and this is Marquette, you know, Marquette, a lifestyle community surfing on the Great Lakes in winter and Traverse City, these are a great example. Also, I heard a presentation from someone else from Minnesota who was giving another example. Small town in Minnesota. Um, they're trying to figure out, what do we do for our economic development strategy? And then someone knows, well, why are all these people like doing ice climbing out in this feature that we've got, this area? And, and so why don't we lean into that and become you know, the ice climbing mecca? And so the, the point is, you gotta lean, figure out what you got to work with that matters and then lean into it and develop it and build on who you are and the things that matter. And as I said, some of these have done a combination of things that have really worked. As I started with, um, Grand Rapids is a great story. Lots of manufacturing job loss, but it's a community that really works together. They redeveloped their downtown, moved in anchor institutions, parts of their university that was out in the cornfields. Um, they built like a medical mile of new research and learning institutions and, and then attracted a, a, a teaching hospital there. Their lead employers, it was the furniture capital. So Steelcase and Herman Miller, they're now, they leaned into being the global leaders in clean uh, production in their supply chains. And they make the high-tech office systems of the future, not the furniture, you know, the office furniture. Uh, and, and they're succeeding. And, and they did um, other things. Green Bay, you know, here's a typical, the flat, it was a paper milling town, polluted the Fox River, it was toxic, leading into Lake Michigan. They've over time cleaned up their waterfront. Waterfront redevelopment's a great tool. Um, they have a University of Wisconsin affiliate that's working more aggressively with their manufacturers to take their manufacturing and their engineering department into the high end. They got, uh, uh, used the Packers brand to create a title town tech venture funding operation for, and new startups to, to have an entrepreneurial ecosystem built with money. Microsoft's president is from nearby. You know, he helped get that seeded. And now Green Bay has turned a corner. And that's Akron, which is doing some similar things. And I know I'm going long, but my message is in similarly situated industrial and even rural regions of our countries, there is no one path to economic renewal in a very changed era, but there are many paths. I mean, Cleveland, that river was on fire as three other rivers were on fire in 1970. Now that flats development on the west side of Cleveland is multi, hundreds of millions of dollars of new development, residential, commercial. You know, I know a number of people who've traveled your Allegheny Passage, who've come from far away to spend days here. And I said I wouldn't talk about your communities, but, and I'm not trying to suggest that anything like that or any one thing can bring back the communities like they used to be around here, but they can be additive and they can get the needle moving up. And you're seeing it all around you actually here. The challenge we face in the region is how do we extend that economic opportunity growth dynamic to more people and places uh, that aren't finding it yet. Because when we do turn an economic corner, as I said, folks are optimistic. They're embracing the future. They're not wishing back 
the day, good old days of the past. Um, and it's, it's maybe keeping us from each other's throats. I'll tell you about that picture. Grand Rapids, as I said, has done a lot of different things well. But it was, some of you know Grand Rapids. West Michigan, it was the conservative part of our state, meaning home to the DeVosses and the very conservative Dutch Republicans, Dutch Reform. Um, one of the DeVosses, as one of many things they did in Grand Rapids, he said, why don't we endow an art prize? Why don't we give a half a million dollars each year and invite all the artists in the world to come and share all their art out in public in all the public spaces? And it's attracted hundreds of thousands of people, uh, not just artists, to come to Grand Rapids. It's made stodgy, conservative Grand Rapids be welcoming to creatives and folks with green hair. And it's a, it's a part of their comeback story. Is, is doing things like that that create it to be a place people come to, want to stay in, and, and are growing again. So uh, it can be done, and I'm hopeful that we can all help each other find ways to do it effectively and also close these divides, both between people and between places that are, are really driving a, a bad politics for us so that we come together and can work together to solve our problems and have a better future. So that's my presentation to you. Wide range of strategies that are being adopted, but many of them centered around revitalizing a sense of place in the downtown. One of the challenges we're facing here in Pittsburgh, and I think a lot of cities are, is that the, the, a lot of the anchor employers there are not seeing the occupancy that they once had uh, from their workers coming back. And so the premise of the strategy is, is sort of under threat. And so just seeing how other communities are responding to that and what you're seeing in terms of, of that for a place-based strategy. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I think in our region, and you, Pittsburgh, you may have evolved further than some places in your downtown, you know, which obviously was getting to be pretty rich and vibrant, which means you may be, have experience with the COVID more of what the New Yorks and others are facing, just you know, reliance on a lot of downtown employment. Um, I think in other places that maybe aren't uh, quite as big, but like a Grand Rapids is actually not seen that. It's seen an acceleration, some of it through purposeful strategy, of making the downtown the place to be, including the place to live, the retrofitting, you know, and even we said we had a presentation when we were in Chicago uh, who was experiencing this phenomenon where the new mayor's economic development person was saying, yeah, we're, we're, we're purposely taking, a, and we've got a affordable housing in the downtown problem anyway, whereas inner ring suburbs or neighborhoods, you know, have been hollowed out by economic change. So we're taking some of these old, um, um, where we're commercial office buildings, you know, in the loop, and we're gonna remake a bunch of them as housing including some affordable, just to get people down there. Because housing is not affordable, and if we have thousands more units in the downtown, it will both get more affordable. So, you know, that's one strategy I just recently saw, um, but I think there are certainly some, some purposeful things you can do to try to prevent that dynamic. But that, that, the, the, the big issue of the pride of place is huge in our discussions in Europe. I mean, these are communities, whether it's Sheffield, England, you know, that invented stainless steel and then was hollowed out, uh, or in the Ruhr, where it was a steel town or a coal town, or in Flint, where I spent a lot of time. There was so much pride in that place and what we did. And one of the things that you got to learn is you can't tell those people that you got to change. You can't, tell those, you can't tell those people what to do either. Like, Progressives get in trouble by yelling at people in the heartland, you gotta go greener, you know, AOC yelling at people is not gonna solve the problem. But what you gotta help people build on their own identity and fashion their own solutions. So only Pittsburgh and only some of these other communities, and one thing we also heard was, and it's common throughout the region given we have so many, so many jurisdictions and you're representing some of them that have lost a lot of population, that have lost a lot of tax base, where is the capacity for you to even plan effectively to take advantage of infrastructure monies or you know distressed community block grant monies and so how do we support you in that capacity so that you can design your own solution with your own community 
and, and, and get it done, you know? And that's probably a, a big thing that we need to all do more on. Right over here. Um, my name is Brian. I work for a local nonprofit called the Homeless Children's Education Fund. Um, and I, you sort of addressed part of my question already uh, in, in your, your speaking about the, the downtown uh, uh, housing uh, uh, that, that I forget what city you had mentioned. Um, Chicago. But, but uh, basically my question was, um, so a lot of the, the place-based investment strategies that you mentioned uh, throughout the presentation, uh, they, they tend to increase property values. They tend to uh, make things more expensive uh, for, for folks to, to buy a home, to, to rent a home. Um, and that frequently displaces people. Uh, and, and so uh, sometimes the dynamic that uh, you might see is uh, uh, as a lot of investment pours into a place, uh, it's a lot harder for people to, to stay there um, who might have been there uh, long term. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any specific examples of places who have six, uh, places that have successfully uh, addressed the, um, that dynamic of increasing property values as these uh, I investments pour in? Um, I think it is a challenge everywhere, but it's also, as you say, it's a challenge when you get the flywheel going, in particular, where we actually have some new development. You know, we were in Detroit, and you know, there's tremendous tension there, as there probably is some here. Like All this downtown, and in our case, midtown corridor and waterfront, who's, who's and, and hipsters moving in, and now you know condos being expensive, while you have miles of neighborhoods that are still struggling and are hollowed out. So you know this is good. It's better that some people are moving in than not. But how do you stitch folks who've been there for a long time into this new economy? And I think you do see it all around here. You know, my answer is. is you, you got to welcome the new economic activity because it is a good, but you got to really work hard and purposely, particularly in our communities that are the most segregated, with with purposeful segregation of economic opportunity by neighborhood through schools by race, um, and so you have to do a bunch of stuff purposely, particularly on the education, training, and connectivity side and transportation side to help folks get what they need to be able to succeed in this changed economy. And I think education and, and a higher education credential for everybody that allows them and go into the communities and make sure the schools and the, the skills are built that help people get these jobs that do exist, that are often going begging. To me, that's job one. That's the main way you can make a different economy work for people. I get really upset when people talk about, we're not enough jobs for low-skilled people. That's not our concern. Our concern is to help everybody get the high skills so that they can get a good paying job. Um, and so that's not a great answer to your question, but it's, it's you know, and to me, it's, it, it, we, we need to appreciate but also spread and connect the economic activity once we get it going versus disappearing and help more people benefit from that and participate in that. And there's a bunch of stuff we need to do a lot more of to make that happen. Hi. Um, hi, Ken Zapinski from Pittsburgh Works Together. We're a business labor uh, alliance that works to promote energy and manufacturing industries um, here in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, I was kind of struck, because you showed the picture of Ann Arbor, and then you showed the picture of Adrian, and then you talked about you know what you could do in Grand Rapids and what you could do in Flint. So you're starting with three larger urban areas, all of which have, at one time, global leading assets that they could build off of, whether it was legacy manufacturing or university or um, uh, uh, Flint. Well, they're both legacy manufacturing, furniture, Herm Herman Miller and Grand Rapids. So I heard a lot about what could be done in places like Rochester or Grand Rapids. I still don't see the connection on how that helps the Adrians or the Onsteads of the world. So, what's the? Wh how do you bridge that? Well, so let's. I'm, interesting. Um, Randy Thalen, who runs the um, economic development operation regionally in West Michigan, 
who had succeeds a woman Berger Close, who ran it for 30 years, was speaking directly about this. And he was, where's my picture of Flint? There we go. So um, this is Flint in Janesville, you know, which also had big GM loss. So he was, he was positing accurately. At one time, Flint and Grand Rapids were, were similarly situated. Same population, same kind of employment in manufacturing, same income levels, same pop, you know. The, and so what's, what's, what made Grand Rapids uh, fail or succeed and what made Flint have such dramatic decline? And one big difference that he didn't mention was um, that Grand Rapids and West Michigan has had a uniquely durable set of civic business and political leaders, the business people locally operating still, that have worked together for 30 years and kind of run a plan, even in the face of tremendous, Grand Rapids lost more manufacturing employment in the Great Recession than any other community. But they've run a plan. Flint has suffered from GMs, uh, shedding 70,000 jobs, but never finding a confection of local leadership with harsher black-white racial divides. You know, the whites have largely left Flint and are out in the suburbs, and as is common in our communities, you know, unfortunately, blame, you know, the black people for wrecking Flint, and they've never found a way to work together regionally. Uh, and so they've left a community without a tax base that can't afford to do anything itself. Uh, and so that's just an illustration where if, if we can help communities or communities on their own can find a way to work together and have local leadership that does figure out what kind of plan to run and how to run it, then they can succeed. I'll, I'll pick on Southeast Michigan again, too. Southeast Michigan is, unlike West Michigan, has had a history of balkanized uh, leadership where the city of Detroit versus Wayne County versus Macomb County versus um, Oakland County versus, and the, fa the foundations there even fight with each other for who's in charge. The um, business leadership groups don't collaborate until just recently CEOs in the region beat them over the head to create like an Allegheny conference. Like we need one functional, you know, Greater Cleveland Partnership or uh, Indianapolis is a partnership where the business community is working together across the region. And so absent that, it's really hard to run a plan for how you can build on your assets and do strategic things that do pay off. And, and it's probably the biggest, even as we talked about this when we had the Europeans in town, because you know, in Europe there's more kind of institutional responsibility, particularly governments you know, with functionaries responsible for regional economic development, whereas we don't have anyone in charge. We have to figure out how to do it ourselves, you know, whether it's the business leadership community or the foundation community. Or, or the political community, the mayors and county executives, and they have to figure out how to work together or not. Um, and so it, it, was, it was an example to them of the vast difference in our system of this, this different leadership or non-leadership in different communities responsible for regional economic development. You know, in some of our communities, it has been like Grand Rapids, all sectors working together. In others, it's the, um, it's the business leadership group that's kind of running the show. In others, it's the university leadership that's trying to do it. We went to Erie. They're, they're all, uh, if, if you're friends with your colleagues in Erie, I'll try not to disrespect them, but basically it appeared like the, the, the mayor and the county government weren't really that dynamic or active. The business, they didn't really have a functional business leadership group, so it was the Jefferson Education Society, which is like a think tank, trying to lead the discussion in the community about how do we manage economic evolution and run a plan, which does, you know, is not perfect, but they're trying to do that. So that's um, my, my, I guess my point is, and I even tried to give you some example of rural communities, small communities that have figured out a plan and are running it with some success. So I think the main encouragement is, and, and the, the, the big, question I wanted to get to, how can outsiders or national leadership or governors or anybody, how, do, how can you effectively catalyze um, economic evolution and community leadership and ownership, because they got to own it themselves, where it doesn't exist naturally, like Grand Rapids? 
how do we do that well? So that you're not doing two, but you're supporting and nurturing and catalyzing a real strategic vision and plan to emerge owned and operated by the community. That's what we're looking for the answer to. If anyone has it, like how do, how do we do that? As national leadership, as regional leaders, as governor? Because some places they figured out how to do it or they've done it. In other places they haven't and those are the Flints and the Saginaws and, and other places that I'm from and the, and the Adrians. Um, while Adrian has two universities and colleges, but there, there's no confection of leadership that's running a strategic vision as there was in Kalamazoo for how we deal with this loss and how we grow the new. Yeah. Another question? Hi, um, my name is Camilla Rivera Tinsley and I work for the Women and Girls Foundation. Um, so my questions are gonna be based in social determinants and these systems that have created. So you started out your presentation talking about um, the segregation, that deep segregation that exists in these mid um, Midwest Atlantic um, uh, states, right? And we see that here in Pittsburgh too. We see Pittsburgh touting itself as you know this great green city, um, and it is. And we see all of these new industries, the same thing that you were talking about um, in your different in your slide deck. But what isn't being said, but it's what's beginning to be said here, is that there are huge swaths of people who are left behind. And I think you alluded to that in the beginning, but what I'm curious about is how does or how has place-based investment strategies in those places where you are considering it to be um, you know, a positive outcome or things that we should look toward, is there data that, can, that, that backs up the fact that these new strategies are not implementing the same old forms of racism, sexism, all of the isms that um, exist right here in Pittsburgh and still exist in those other spaces. So I, I just, I don't, I, I guess I didn't hear anything about addressing those. Um, and also, what is your metric for success? And does success include social determinant outcomes? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, because that is hugely important. And in that Vital Midwest report, we did try to have a chapter on communities that are leading their change by focusing on inclusive economic growth, making sure that this economy, as we evolve it, is, is working for everybody, including marginalized populations or historically marginalized populations. Um, ironically, before George Floyd, Minneapolis was probably doing more as a business leadership community to try to help make that happen, focusing on inclusive. All right, now we're thriving again, but it's not working for everybody, so we got to focus with metrics on are we moving the needle for you know jobs incomes quality housing health for our minority populations as our you know thriving Minneapolis St. Paulers are doing um, and and I know in Cleveland I know in Detroit they're talking a big game about that as maybe you are here I don't know about that that's got to be a priority for us because this now that we're seeing some growth as I said in Detroit in certain corridors benefiting certain people we have to m move a more equitable economic development strategy. What are the family of strategies that can work that we do it? But again, you face real challenges given the power dynamics in our history. There's, you know, my son in Detroit, who's now at Carnegie Mellon, he worked for a organization, African community-led organization, the People's Platform, which is, is the residents of the city of Detroit, mostly African-American, saying, no, this is what we want the plan to be for housing and for land development, which was a big issue in Detroit. Um, and what you foundations, Kresge, well-intentioned, and what you, Mayor Duggan, are trying to do to us is not what we want. So there's tremendous tension. It's really hard to do that better than we've managed to do it in the past. We were in Milwaukee where a friend of mine, Walter Lanier, is um, running a new organization that they created, the African Alliance uh, of Milwaukee. Milwaukee is the most segregated city in the region with the sharpest divides and had the same problems in Milwaukee that we had in Southeast Michigan where we're not gonna have a transit system because of the you know white folks don't wanna either subsidize or have black people coming into their communities. Same thing in the Milwaukee region. Um, and so they, it's, they have a functional civic business leadership group, the Milwaukee Committee and their chambers of commerce work together, but they've, they've empowered and funded and 
uh, Walter and this African American leadership group to try to, how do we work better on equity with excellence uh, as a community and are trying to find those strategies. And I think, you know, they're, they're, they're well-intentioned, they're, they're purposeful about naming it, being honest about it, and they have an African American mayor now who's trying to do what he can to encourage that and be helpful. And as I said, it is, it is really hard, given who we are in this region, to do that better than we've done it. Uh, I know folks are trying in lots of different ways in different places, and actually Walter's looking to connect with peers in other communities who are working on similar challenges and find, because we're all, we're so similar, you know, from Buffalo to Pittsburgh to Milwaukee to Detroit in our, in our socioeconomic political fabric, you know, and cultural fabric. So if you'd like to you know, hook you up with Walter, he might have some better answers than me on what's going on that's real and purposeful, but I know it's, it's hugely important. Well, we have time for one more question. No? Okay, so please help me thank John. Thank you.